Hello, everyone. Welcome to the fourth session of the online colloquium Pluralizing the Anthropocene, envisioning the future of the planet in the 21st century. My name is Gonzalo Santos. I'm a social cultural anthropologist based at the Research Center for Anthropology and Health and the Department of Life Sciences at the University of Coimbra. I am also the director of the International Research Network SciTech Asia. Let me welcome the other moderator of today's session. Hi, Anna Luisa, would you like to introduce yourself? Thank you, Gonzalo. Hi. Hi, Elena. My name is Anna Luisa Santos. I am a biological anthropologist and paleopathologist at the Department of Life Science and at the Research Center for Anthropology and Health at the University of Coimbra. Let me welcome also our speaker today, distinguished biologist Elena Freitas. Hi, Elena. Welcome Hi. to Pluralizing the Anthropocene. Many, many thanks for joining us. Thank you. Before moving on to a proper introduction of our guest speaker, I'd like to say a few words about the background of this colloquium, especially for those of you who are joining us for the first time. Pluralizing the Anthropocene is a project created by myself and my colleague Anna Luisa Santos, building on a partnership between several institutions, representing the sciences, the arts and the humanities. The Research Center for Anthropology and Health, the Fundação de Serralde, the Research Network SciTech Asia, the Center for Functional Ecology, Science for People and the Planet, and the Department of Life Sciences at the University of Coimbra. We would like to thank these institutions for making this colloquium possible. Many thanks also to the members of the Sahavs technical team for their wonderful support. Sahavs is a leading global cultural institution known for its role in promoting public debates on topics that matter to everyone. And this colloquium is a wonderful example of this mission. Public response to the colloquium has been overwhelming. More than 1,800 people registered for this talk, including people from many different countries and professional backgrounds. I would like to thank everyone for their support. When Anna Louise and myself started designing this colloquium last year, our goal was to open an open, multivocal and international forum of debate on important issues that are not getting as much attention as they should. The world's attention at the moment is focused on tackling a global pandemic that has proved far more deadly than initially predicted. But we also need to think about some of the underlying issues shaping the present epoch of increasing anthropogenic environmental uncertainties, of which the COVID-19 pandemic is only a byproduct. The world we live in is very different from that of our grandparents and great grandparents. It's warmer, drier, more polluted. And if the trend of ruination continues, it's more than likely that we will compromise the livability of the planet for the future generations. The current production and consumption system has brought many benefits to a large number of people and populations around the world, even if with significant inequalities but it has also led to unprecedented levels of environmental destruction and to a conjuncture of global warming and climate change with increasingly visible effects. The present decade, the third of the 21st century, will be decisive when it comes to addressing these issues and planning a little bit better the future of our communities before we plunge into a conjuncture of chaos, confusion and rising inequalities even more disturbing than what we are already currently experiencing under the COVID-19 pandemic. There are, of course, many people who are denying the relevance of many of these concerns, but even these people cannot really ignore ongoing debates on environmental destruction, climate change and the future of the planet. These are the biggest challenges of the epoch we live in, the Anthropocene or the age of humans. The term Anthropocene was coined by the late atmospheric scientist Paul Crutzen in a conference sometime in the year 2000 to highlight the role of human activities in climate change. The term was then appropriated by geologists to refer to the present geological era as a period in which humans have become one of the most potent geophysical forces in the planet. And their activities are leading to increasing environmental uncertainty. We are now in 2021 and Paul Crutzen died earlier this year and there is still no consensus within the geophysical sciences on the validity of the term Anthropocene, just as there is no consensus on the precise beginning of the Anthropocene as a geological era. 
But most scholars would agree that the environmental impact of the human planetary expansion has become increasingly visible after the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, and in particular after the great global acceleration that took place after World War II. In the last two decades, the term Anthropocene has gained increasing popularity beyond the geophysical sciences, entering the humanities, the social sciences, the arts and the media, and leading to the development of critical alternative terms like Capitalocene and many other, all of which defined in relation to the original concept of the Anthropocene. Whichever way we look at this concept, the Anthropocene has entered global, cultural and political imaginaries as some kind of hyper object or magnet that helps capture the tensions and the dilemmas of the age we live in. An age that is marked by increasing anxieties about the future of human life on the planet. But the Anthropocene is not just about the runaway world of environmental doom. It is also about overcoming disaster and catastrophe and creating new visions of hope and justice. The realities of environmental pollution, anthropogenic climate change, species extinction and sea level rise compel a reimagining of humanity's place in the world and an urgent rethinking of the dominant forces threatening the ecological balance of the planet. A rethinking that must go beyond make do patchwork interventions like simplistic forms of green capitalism. Using the term Anthropocene to refer to the current age of increasing anthropogenic environmental uncertainties has started new conversations about what needs to be changed in the global economic system. But it has also generated a monolithic understanding of the Anthropocene as a unified human experience. The framing of the Anthropocene around the universalizing species paradigm has a homogenizing effect that hides significant exclusions and inequalities. Not all humans are equally implicated in the major forces driving contemporary human environmental crises, and not all humans, and hardly any non-humans, are invited into the conceptual spaces where these disasters are theorized or responses to disaster formulated. If we really want to do something to change the current economic system, we need to be capable of developing a more inclusive conversation. And we need to be capable of building a global economy that is no longer focused on conquering nature, but on learning how to coexist with a plurality of life forms around us. Pluralizing the Anthropocene features well-known scholars committed to developing a more inclusive and diverse understanding of Anthropocene debates of resilience, adaptation, and the struggle for environmental justice. Every talk will be followed by an informal conversation and a Q&A session with the audience via the chat function. The chat function is currently closed, but it will open towards the end of Professor Freitas' talk. If you would like to ask a question, please prepare your question and have it, have it ready to be posted in the chat box once the Q&A session starts. This talk will be conducted in English. If you need language assistance, Microsoft Teams has a live transcript function that can be activated by pressing the live transcript symbol that is located in the right bottom corner of the application. A number of languages are available via this functionality, so please feel free to activate it. Please bear in mind that this event is being recorded by Sahav and it will be later released for public viewing via social media and the internet. The videos of the three previous sessions of Pluralizing the Anthropocene are already available in Saralvish YouTube channel. But let me go back to the main reason we are all here today. In our first session, anthropologist Tim Ingold argued that the global economic system must be rebuilt around a more encompassing notion of sustainability, the sustainability of everything, because the sustainability of everything is the sustainability of the planet. In our second session, anthropologist Anand Singh called for a more plural, historically expanded understanding of the Anthropocene, and she made a compelling case for the need to rewrite the history of modern environmental destruction from a more than human perspective. In our third session, anthropologist Agustin Fuentes took this more than human perspective to another level by bringing into focus the ecologies of despair and hope shaping the relations between humans and other animals in the Anthropocene. Today, biologist Elena Freitas will talk about the need to respect nature and the challenges of developing international policy frameworks capable of promoting nature conservation and reverting global trends 
of environmental deg degradation and biodiversity decline. I'm very much looking forward to this talk and I will now hand over the floor to my colleague Anna Louisa for her to introduce our guest speaker. It's my honor to introduce our guest, Elena Freitas, full professor of biodiversity and ecology at the Department of Life Science of the Faculty of Science and Technology of the University of Coimbra. Professor Elena Freitas received her PhD in ecology from the University of Coimbra in collaboration with the University of Bielefeld in, in uh, Germany and did postdoctoral uh, studies at Stanford University in US. She holds the UNESCO Chair in Biodiversity and Conservation for Sustainable uh, Development since 2014. In 2019, she was selected to join the Mission Board for Climate Change Adaptation, including societal transformation for the European Commission and was nominated to focal point for Portugal in Intergovernmental Platform for Biodiversity and Ecosystem Service. Currently, uh, is the coordinator of the Center for uh, Functional Ecology, Science for the People and the Planet. Her research interests include ecology, ecology and society, Mediterranean ecosystem, forest and agriculture, ecology and management of exotic and invasive species, environmental policies and bioenergy, among many others. Professor Elena Freitas is the author of more than 300 international scientific publications and several publications promoting and disseminating science. We are delighted to have you here, Elena. Thank you so much. And with no further delays, let's listen to Professor Elena Freitas' talk, The Need to Respect Nature and Its Limits. Please. Thank you very much, Ana Luisa, and thank you, Gonzalo. Well, actually, thank you very much for the, the opportunity to join these conferences, Pluralizing the Anthropocene, and uh, the chance to share with you some aspects of the complex relationship between people and nature. I believe that the pandemic has made more evident and widely perceived the degradation of ecosystems with consequences for the planet and certainly for human health and well-being. Pursuing with this nature destruction, we will have more pandemics, will increase other risks and inequality in the access to ecosystem goods and services. The decade we live in is critical and it is important to quickly support the narratives and build the initiatives that help us to foster the path for sustainability. Our challenge is to live, to produce and to consume, respecting the boundaries of the planet. It is not just a question of the conservation of nature and biodiversity, but of preserving the functioning of the systems that support life on the planet. It will imply a profound and radical change and the complexity of the change is huge. This is why I think that this type of interdisciplinary forum is important to empower ourselves and to promote the ecological transition. My topic today will be the need to respect nature and its limits. And that's what I plan to show you today. I hope I managed them. Um... A recent uh, survey by the World Economic Forum clearly reveals that environmental concerns are very present in the perception of the citizens. As you can see, climate issues, the biodiversity crisis and natural disasters are people's real concerns and, and local, regional and global political responses need to be addressed. An effective commitment to solve problems, taking into account all realities, geographies, diversities and all conditions of access to resources. Where are the critical earth system processes and their boundaries? There are more disruptive aspects in the relationship of human activities with the planet that are more evident or better studied. Issues such as biogeochemical cycles like, for example, and I would like to highlight soil contamination, water and nitrogen systems, changes in land use, 
climate change, invasive species, and biodiversity are clearly perceived as problematic and that it's at the limit of planetary tolerance. These are the urgent issues that we have to address. We are part of nature, not separate from it. We rely on nature to provide us with food, water and shelter, regulate our climate and diseases, maintain nutrient cycles, cycles and oxygen production, provide us with spiritual fulfillment and opportunities for recreation, which can enhance our health and well-being. We also use the planet as a sink for our waste products, such as carbon dioxide, plastics, and other forms of waste, including pollution. Science has highlighted the need to regain the balance of this relationship, and I believe that the pandemic has shown very clearly our interdependence. How is in science managed somehow to approach over the last two decades, especially managed to approach this uh, um, the, somehow the uh, to show how we need nature and the benefits that we get to na from nature with the, the conceptual framework that I'm showing you, where you can see that life supporting systems are based on biodiversity. Biodiversity is the raw material of ecosystems. And by biodiversity, I mean species richness, genetic diversity, biotic interactions, functional traits, ecological processes. These are functions of the ecosystems that provide us what we need, essentially, and basically everything. Ecosystem services are the benefits people obtain from ecosystems and can be classified as provisional, fiber, food, fresh water, regulative, like disease management, climate regulation, fresh water, supportive, nutrient cycling, pollination, soil formation, and of course, cultural, religious, spiritual, those that we sometimes uh, and don't even think they are a provision of the ecosystems. This is a, the, the, one of the conceptual um, uh, frameworks that is best known in terms of presenting uh, the ecosystem services and uh, why we need them and uh, this, um, the translation of these services to the socioeconomic systems. Basically, without these ecosystem services, we, cannot, we don't benefit of nutrition, clear, clean air, water, health, safety, and so many, so many services. A recent work by the International Intergovernmental Platform for Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services has recognized the need to accommodate a greater diversity of values into the decision making through the framework of so-called nature contributions to people. That means all the contributions, both positive and negative, of living nature, diversity of organisms, ecosystems, and their associated ecological and evolutionary processes to the quality of life for people. Nature contributions to people, providing a perspective on human nature relations that goes behind the stock flow, ecosystem services, decision making, framing. Nature Nature Contributions to People offers real potential to enable land system science to better integrate the many diverse value systems of stakeholders and institutions into efforts to better understand and more fairly govern the increasing trade-offs of land systems in the Anthropocene, especially under conditions of less well-functioning institutions and governance. What are these some just a few examples of the nature conditions to people in subdivided by regulating material and non-material. In terms of regulating nature contributions to people, habitat creation, pollination and dispersal of seeds, that is fundamental for the farming systems, regulation of air quality, of climate, ocean, freshwater, protection of soils. All the systems are regulated by nature. Material, energy, food and feed. Non-material, learning and inspiration, experiences, supporting identities. 
Biodiversity in nature contributes to people, some to many people academic, and far removed from our daily lives. But nothing could be further from the truth. They are the bedrock of our food, clean water, and energy. They are the heart not only of our survival, but of, of our cultures, identities, and enjoyment of life. We must act to halt and reverse the unsustainable use of nature, or risk not only the future we want, but even the lives we currently lead. Fortunately, the evidence also shows that we know how to protect and partially restore our vital natural assets. Some examples of this degradation are more and more clear. In terms of indirect and direct drivers of examples of ecosystem services degradation, the so-called direct drivers or indirect drivers, the direct drivers of, of, of degradation of ecosystem services are especially land use and sea change, direct exploitation, invasive alien species. But we also have indirect drivers of ecosystem services degradation, climate change, pollution. The fact is that we can, it's, this is a very recent assessment, we, we, can, we, can, we can identify that natural ecosystems have declined almost 50% on average relative to the earliest estimate states. 25% of species are already threatened with extinction and or decline in most animal and plant studied. Almost one fourth of, of, of ecological communities have declined on average terrestrial communities since prehistory. More than 80% of biomass with wild mammals has fallen by more than 80%. This is huge. But in spite of this acknowledgement, we keep degrading. Global trends in the capacity of nature to contribute to good quality of life from 70 to the present is amazing, is very impressive. Global trends in the capacity to contribute to good quality of life, as you can see, just a number of examples. 14 of the 18 categories of nature contributions to people show a decline. Half of the 18 categories show consistent patterns globally, whereas the other half show declines in some regions and gains in others. For example, forest areas and the nature contributions to people supported by forests have generally declined in tropical regions while increasing in some temperate areas over the past 50 years. Of course, I cannot go deeply into every topic, but it's quite relevant to see the number, the number of nature contributions to people that is showing a steep decline after 1970. Another example of uh, these nature contributions to people, what you can see, especially in Africa, which is a huge continent, this is another original, uh, original report for Africa by the IPBS. And it's uh, and you can see, uh, especially one of the ecosystems that provide essential ecosystem services for most native indigenous communities of Africa, and they are losing at a huge rate, like mangroves. Coastal mangroves are essentially for protection, providing with food, carbon sequestration, timber, a number of ecosystems and good and services and goods are from this essential biome. But in spite of it, it's one of the most degraded ecosystem of, the, of, of Africa. And let's look a bit into the into the major, the so-called major environmental categories. The percentage of damage or lost is again huge. You can see in red is 50% of degradation. And if you see the earth surface, oceans, kelp forests, seagrass meadows, predatory fishes, coral, terrestrial vegetation, wetland area, most of these major categories of environmental systems are, are threatened uh, and seriously threatened. Essentially, we can say, we can say that the planet, the planet exists for us and the availability of land area for wildlife 
is uh, impressively small. You can see you have uh, the earth land mammals by weight. You can see, of course, humans, and then you can see our pets and livestock. And then a very tiny portion is left for wild animals. If you, if you, if we notice in terms of global biomass, for example, across mammals and birds, it's the same, the same kind of of of, of data. So we, as you as as, as I have, I have uh, shown in the previous slide, four percent of global biomass in mammals are from wild animals. Most of it are from from humans or farm animals. If we see birds. Is the same kind of ratio. Less than 30% are for wild birds and the others farm chicken or farm ducks. So more and more, the world somehow is configured in terms of humans, humans activities and responses to humans. So what about the others? Of the kind of of kind of the, especially the fauna and big mammals that are truly suffering from this from this pressure on the planet. The following population declines over several decades due, in this case for elephants due to poaching for ivory and loss of habitat. The African savanna elephant is considered endangered on the ICN red list of threatened species. But the 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 African forest elephant is now listed as critical endangered by the same red list. And the same goes to many animals that 10 years ago you wouldn't expect to see the, the giraffe, for example, in the same kind of list, but it is. Or in the, America, in the Americas, the jaguar, or the gorilla in Africa, or the, or the leopard, the Himalayan leopard, or the polar bear. One of I show this, this uh, these examples because it's not only the pressure of the of the poaching and the loss of habitat, but now also climate change. The risk in diversity in different taxonomic groups. Approximate number of described species of animals, plants, and fungi. You can see on the left and the bars of the left. And the proportion of species that are threatened with extinction, the pie charts, and groups that have been globally assessed by the IUCN Red List 54, either comprehensively, like for example, legumes, monocots, ferns, dragonflies, reptiles, through a sample approach, and proportions assume that data deficient species are equally threatened as non data deficient species, which is not exactly true. But the proportion of data deficient species in each group are mammals with 50%, birds, reptiles, 21%, amphibians, 23%, and so on. The proportions of data, in fact, you can see you can see this kind of this kind of trend in every groups in all species. Examples of global declines in nature that have been and are being caused by direct and, and indirect drivers of change. Each of the direct drivers of change, land use or sea use change, direct exploitation of organisms, climate change, pollution, including plastics, heavy metals, and direct effects of CO2, for example, terrestrial photosynthesis and seawater pH and invasive, invasive, invasive alien species. Represents the aggregation of many consequences from sectors such as crop production, animal husbandry, fishing, logging, hunting, mining for minerals, fossil fuels, development of cities and infrastructure for electricity and transport, and the transport of people and itself. The direct drivers result from an array of underlying societal causes. These causes can be demographic, for example, human population dynamics, socio-cultural, for example, consumption patterns, economic, for example, trade, technologically relating to institutions, governance, conflicts and epidemics. These are called indirect drivers, are underpinned by societal values and behaviors. 
land and sea change in direct exploitation account for more than 50% of the global impact on land and freshwater in the sea, but each diver is dominant in certain systems or places. The circles illustrate the magnitude of the negative human impacts on a diverse selection of aspects of nature over a range of different timescales, selected from a global synthesis of indicators, ecosystem extent, ex extinction risk, and biomass, and species ab abundance include terrestrial, freshwater, and marine species and ecosystems, also most is known about life on land. Just an example, again, examples of declines in nature, ecosystem, natural ecosystems have declined by 40, 40, almost 50% on average. Species extinction, ecological communities, the so-called biotic integrity, especially by invasions, biomass and species abundance, and the new or should have been before addressed before, but is now becoming more and more relevant in terms of assessment and uh, hopefully also in international policies, nature for indigenous people and local communities. More than 70% of indicators developed by indigenous peoples and local communities show an ongoing deterioration of elements of nature important to them. So what are the solutions and what are the responses to manage to somehow to generate and to implement. One of the main policy instruments to slow the loss of biodiversity and degradation of nature is the creation of protective conservation areas. Currently, 60% of the land, 16% of the land and 7.4 of the ocean is in areas designated or proposed for protection. Also, only 2.5% of the ocean is in highly fully protected areas. This level of protection is widely acknowledged as being inadequate to achieve biodiversity protection goals. Actually, we have failed a lot and it's very much visible in all documents, all the assessments that we've been producing. One of the headline proposals for the 15th meeting of the Conference of the Parties to the Convention for Biological Diversity that was supposed to be held last year, but due to the pandemics has been postponed and is supposed to happen this year, by the end of the year. And it's a very important convention for biodiversity. We very much hope to have some kind of agreement, the same type of agreement as the Paris for Climate. We hope to have some kind of agreement of the same of the same intensity and compromise and commitment, international commitment for biodiversity this year, we hope so. And one of the main objectives is to have an effective area based on conservation measures to 30% of the planet by 2030, including both land and water protection. This is one of the goals of the global biodiversity framework that we are planning for the next decade. What else can we do? A lot. Governments need to do more to protect natural capital and put in place a combination of policy reforms to reduce negative impacts on biodiversity, such as reforming harmful agricultural subsidies, reducing investment risk by public and private investors. Governance must, worldwide, must develop new financial innovations to increase available funding for conservation, promoting green investments and supporting development of nature-based solutions, natural infrastructure and biodiversity offsets. And But we keep, in spite of, of this understanding, in spite of these intensive discussions, and we are pretty much aware of what's going on and where are the problems and what can be the solutions, we have the solutions. We keep having and promoting agricultural subsidies, forestry subsidies, fishery subsidies that are extremely harmful for nature and for biodiversity conservation. And the same uh, goes for the farming systems, the food system. The food system is one of our major challenges. Of course, we have to respond uh, to the to, to the to the needs of, of for food, 
worldwide and we know and we know that the population is increasing at a very high rate and uh, all the systems have to respond to this but we have to change our food system because it is it is really very very much wrong of course we cultivate and we keep cultivating a, num a number of i'm sorry a number of um, uh, i mean a, a number of of products that that are being sold and trade all over the planet and uh, at some cost and the cost is of course uh, one of the major costs that we 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 know very much realize is regarding this what is related to the further the the application of fertilizers and pesticides in order to have this kind of productivity the farming is the farming system of our uh, most important challenges to uh, preserve nature and ecosystem services just a short example of um, one of the major impacts of the food system and, uh, and uh, the application of, of, of herbicides, insecticides and the contamination of soils and uh, through the, the food system and the way how we've been cultivating in, in many, in all, basically everywhere in the world. And one of the impacts that is becoming very clear is on insight, insect decline in, in the Anthropocene. Uh, we have, uh, there are differences, of course, uh, if we are in, in the Americas, in Europe or Africa, but for example, in Europe, we we have numbers of around 70% of uh, of decline of insects over the over the last decades. And it's, these are, this loss of insects is very much worrying because um, the loss of insects means that we will lose one of the most relevant ecosystem services that is pollination and without pollination we won't have um, we, we we cannot feed uh, people we cannot keep feeding uh, people because the systems depend are very much most of the farming systems are very much dependent on on insects on pollinators and the loss of pollinators is a result a direct result of the way how we've been producing, especially, as I said, farming systems. So, um, the Global Living Planet Index uh, is um, um, a very clear picture of, uh, of what has been uh, happening over the last uh, five, six, six decades after 1970. The population size of mammals, birds, fish, amphibians, and reptiles have seen an alarming average drop of almost 70% since 1970. So the conservation of biodiversity, if we assume it, that is the foundation of a sustainable economy, because we get water, food, shelter, and energy, the building blocks upon which life and economic systems are built. So basically, we have to align our economy with environmental systems. It is imperative and the society can no longer afford to ignore. Some of the international organizations that are very much uh, um, organizing, I mean, and running the, these nature, nature issues like the IUCN, is actively promoting the green, uh, the world economy, encouraging governments to mainstream environmental values. And one of the one of the one of the most important outputs of these exercises is nature and solutions. And I will, I'm going to show you very quickly because, to, in my opinion, this is one of the best one of the best programs uh, to restore ecosystems, restore nature, and start a new alignment of our economic systems with the conservation of nature and, and, and the environment in general. Nature-based solutions are defined by the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, IUCN, as actions to address societal challenges through the protection, sustainable management and restoration of ecosystems, benefiting both biodiversity and human well-being. They use the power of nature and functioning ecosystems as infrastructure to provide natural services to benefit society. They have the, the potential to help to address global challenges such as climate change, 
economic and social development, human health, food and water security, disaster risk, risk reduction, and can provide long-term environmental society and economic benefits by adaptation to climate change, green jobs, community resilience, health benefits, and so on. Some examples, but I will show a few ones because this has to go inside the international policies, regional policies, municipal policies. These are the, the programs that we should, that's where we should put our money in order not only to respond to the societal challenges, but also to keep our planet sustainable. And that means protection of restoration of coastal ecosystems, forest landscapes, restoration of wetlands, providing space for rivers, for rivers to naturally flow, urban green and blue spaces. We have, we have the knowledge, we have the technology, we have the will, I think. Just an example in going through different habitats from mountains to the coastal, to coasts. We know that we have loss of life and assets due to intensive wildfires. So what is the solution? Forest management to reduce risk of superfires. We know that we have contamination due, due to flooding. What is the solution? Restore wetlands to absorb and filter flood waters. The same goes for livestock loss due to drought. What is the solution? Agroforestry to make better use of soil moisture and reduce evaporation. Urban flooding due to intense rainfall. What is the solution that responds to the to, to society, but also uh, it can be can be in an envelope of, for, for, for the, the green economy. Restore water courses, expand green spaces, introduce surfaces to reduce flood risk. The loss of land and assets due to rising sea levels, what are the solutions? Restore coastal wetlands, including enhancing general measures. We have a number of solutions for everything, for all our environmental problems and concerns. We just have to implement them. We, we just have to choose. It's a new world. It's the most intelligent choice that we can make. And when we benefit, when we work with nature to come up with the solutions, we are at the same time responding to societal challenges and problems. We are, when we respond to the nature agenda, we respond to the, 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 the development agenda. When we, when we, when we, when we use agriculture instead of intensive farming systems, we are working for climate change and also for food security and also for human health. This is very much connected. Nature-based solutions are the best approach to come up with a new economy. And somehow we've been, uh, things are happening, but we need more, we need more. The urgency, the emergency of the problems is, is, is really critical. So we have to, we have, we have to accelerate. In terms of biodiversity, we need an agenda for a pluralistic perspective about biodiversity in science, in policy and in practice. And that means in science that we have to improve the understanding of the biodiversity value systems to describe living nature. In terms of practice, we have to engage with diverse legitimate biodiversity perspectives. Everybody can bring knowledge. The knowledge is not only inside the academy, it's everywhere. The policy recognized by diversity society interactions across sectors and of course building up the structures that can that can bring the new policies. There are some attempts as uh, in terms of uh, environmental policies and I would like to call your attention for that because uh, might be that the Green Deal is a reality. I don't know if it is as much as it should be, but in any case, the Green Deal is one of the policy package that we have in Europe and uh, and uh, and uh, hopefully uh, all over all over the world. It's well, it's one of the one of one of the policy packages that is based on carbon tax, high energy efficiency, renewable energy, but it's also 
a balance in between the so-called green growth and the degrowth kind of perspective. That's one of the one of the one of the, <laughs> of the policy is uh, the the major policy investment of of, you, of the European Union. So I, I'm just showing you because it's a a very good uh, and instrumental pack pack of policies that I hope will start to make a difference in terms of 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 choices choices that are more in favor into nature when when they are in favor of nature they are certainly in favor of humans and human uh, well-being and the european green deal is very much an assemblage of programs that really look into the uh, very uh, very good targets and uh, very important and, and defined targets of zero pollution for a toxic free environment, preserving and restoring ecosystems and biodiversity, the farm to fork strategy for, for, for agriculture and building a friendly food system, accelerating the shift to sustainable and smart, smart mobility, supplying clean, affordable and secure energy and so well and um, hopefully, financing this transition, which is still one of the one of the empty boxes of this strategy, but hopefully it will be more and more relevant and and filled with with content, with with really with effective investment in order to make this transition possible. And at the same time, we cannot we it is uh, one of the most challenging. For all of us, is we cannot leave well, no one behind. The just transition, it's also not easy to achieve. But at least we have a, a polit political strategy that is very much in the right direction, I think. So we hope that 2021 is the year to reconcile humanity with nature. And I just take this this sentence of Antonio Guterres, uh, the United Nations Secretary General. Is, is, is a Portuguese. Uh, I'm happy to have a Portuguese making such a declaration, and I I hope that he's right. And we are all together in this starting uh, uh, together this this transi transition for a new green economy that is really very much an alignment between the protection of nature and and the well-being of all uh, the entire communities. Um, just uh, the contribution, and it's it's very important to bring this issue because it's uh, the truth is that we have uh, a number of a number of uh, of um, territories and communities that are very much outside this mainstream. So we have a lot of very nice concepts and conceptual and frameworks, but they are really very much oriented to this one type, one kind of world. And as we are discussing the Anthropocene, it's, it's good to have these different perspectives and to acknowledge the relevance of so many communities, so many local communities and ind indigenous people that are doing so much to preserve nature and to preserve this biodiversity legacy for the future. Um, and there's a wide range of practices of indigenous people and local communities maintaining and enhance wild and domestic biodiversity, domestication and maintenance of locally adapted crop and fruit varieties and animal breeds, as an example in Peru, for example, or Kyrgyzstan, creating new ecosystems. Uh, it's another, another important role of these cultural landscapes enhancing habitat heterogeneity, protecting and preventing forest lots. It's, it's very important to see the, the, the role and to recognize in all these international programs and international dynamics, the relevance of these communities for the, for the present and for the future. With at least in, it's uh, uh, over, uh, at least 30, you can see here remaining terrestrial areas with very low human intervention. A lot of these land land areas are traditionally owned and managed, and used or occupied by indigenous people. And that is in these territories, we have probably um, a huge percentage of areas that are somehow protected. And, um, and because due to the 
due to the role of these communities. So what is going to be this? Uh, how are we planning this transformation and this transition? How are we enabling enabling this transformative change? This is a huge challenge for the traditional and conventional kind of way how we organize ourselves in terms, for example, the levers, the so-called the levers, what are the players, the agents of transformation. We need new collaborative implementation of priority interventions targeting key points of intervention could enable transformative change from current trends toward more sustainable ones. Effectively addressing these levers and leverage points requires innovative governance approaches and organizing the processes around nexuses or the missions, representing closely in the interdependent and complementary goals. We need to focus on feeding humanity without deteriorating nature on land, meeting climate goals without incurring massive land use change and biodiversity loss, conserving and restoring nature on land while contributing positively to human quality of life. And we need uh, leverage points, reducing total consumption and waste, unleash value production, reduce inequalities, practice justice and inclusion in conservation, and so on. Much like this very recent report of UNEP uh, 2021 on making peace with nature is the how this report was named. A very nice report on uh, and basically showing the road, the kind of roadmap. Transforming nature puts human well-being at risk. That's the 1970 up to now scenario. Human development, we had the economy has grown nearly fivefold and trade tenfold. Human population has doubled to almost 8 billion. Still, 1.3 billion people are poor and 700 million hungry. Regarding waste, greenhouse gas emissions have doubled. Chemical production, waste and pollution have increased. Resource use has tripled. Human impact, three in four of ice free land and two thirds of ocean, oceans. And the earth capacity and supporting life, what happened there? Livelihoods, equity, health, economic development, peace, all these are risks. So we have to transform humankind's relationship with nature. It, this is the key to a sustainable future. And that's my expectation for the next decade sustainable economic and financial systems, healthy, nutritious food and clean water and energy, healthy lives and well-being for all in safe cities and settlements, net zero carbon dioxide emissions by 2050. This is very much more and more the roadmap for decarbonization all over the world. We have this in the transition of energy going on, management of chemicals, waste and pollution, recycling of resources, circular economy, protection and sustainable use of land of oceans, earth capacity, so we have to restore and adapt to eliminate poverty, one of the goals of the of the 2030 agenda of the United Nations, equity, health, economic development, peace, food, water, sanitation, safe cities and settlement. I'm just uh, almost um, I will uh, I will finish soon, but this is just I would like to show you. This is the framework for the new the convention for the for the that is is the is the framework for the new the, the future of biodiversity, and it's a, a very clever implementation application of the theory of change of, for the framework that acknowledges the need for appropriate recognition of gender equality, women's empowerment, youth gender responsive approaches and the full and effective participation of indigenous people and local communities in implementation of this framework. The vision for this framework that is going to be accepted and approved by uh, all, uh, I hope, uh, the entire planet is the vision that we have is 
living in harmony with nature by 2050. We don't have many years, we have some. And I will finish with this, uh, with this very nice, very nice um, slide of uh, the, the 7th of, of uh, April was the, um, the World Health Day. And the World Health Organization, together with the Convention for Biodiversity, came up with this, with this uh, integration of uh, health and biodiversity and nature. One planet, one health is the roadmap. If we fight for, for a good health and well-being, we have to fight at the same time for nature, to preserve nature and for and to and biodiversity, because biodiversity is the basis of human health. To have health and good health, uh, we need to have the basis, the root of the system. The raw matter is biodiversity and ecosystems. And then we can respond to climate change, water quality, air quality, nutrition, agriculture, biodiversity, mental health, biomedical and pharmaceutical discovery. These are all um, dependent on the preservation of biodiversity and integrity of ecosystems. So my hope is that the pandemic will change our collective priorities. We have the chance to prioritize what has proved truly important and necessary. Each of us will keep our memory. But as a society, it has become evident the need for a sound public health system capable of responding to all. The importance of supporting science and scientific research, the emergence of climate change and the need to address its consequences in an organized and global manner, an effective political and social interest in reducing inequalities, a real debate on aging and how to tackle it. Nature's individualistic and predatory lifestyle cannot continue. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Uh, excellent. And certainly the audience will have questions or comments that uh, can ask in the chat function that is now opened. Meanwhile, I would like to ask your opinion about uh, one or two uh, thoughts. From your lecture and whenever one reads scientific information about the shrinking limits of the planet resources or about the largest consequence of climate change, it is easy to get apprehensive and afraid of the future and this goes looks to 2050 uh, in many in a few decades however when one looks at the policies that are currently being discussed and implemented at the international level one cannot see the same concern with nature and also in everyday life many people do not seem to be concerned or are not informed about how with small gestures everyone can make a contribution uh, to processes of nature preservation. Uh, let's uh, imagine that you uh, are in a powerful position, let's say in the United Nations or another new uh, institution, uh, for the implementation of new measures. What do you think priorities uh, should be? Uh, the action should be at the level of governments, at the level of citizenship, uh, or the education of uh, the youngest. Hmm. Well, thank you for your question. Are you listening to me? I'm not sure. Yes, thank you. Yes. Well, thank you very much for your question. I, I well, if if I was running the United Nations, you mean? <laughs> Or uh, another institution, or another one, uh, United World, or something like that. <laughs> no, I think that well, uh, in, in, in a, we we came to to a, to a momentum in the in the history of uh, of, the, of the planet and humanity where we we clearly need um, world commitments in order to solve these big threats and uh, and problems. That is clear. So we cannot solve them without 
a strong engagement and commitment at the, at, at the global level. And that's one of the things that is really keep, keep postponing the, uh, so many really uh, urgencies. And uh, so, and I, but I think that uh, this kind of perception is more and more um, uh, in, inside this big organization. So let's start by United Nations. Clearly, it's it's very impressive the kind of uh, the, the, the effort of Antonio Guterres for bringing up the, the climate agenda and, and, and making his best to, to have it in the, in, the, in the front of all the international policies. It's, it's very impressive, I mean, because it's, uh, it's, it's, it's really um, an, amazing, an amazing role that he is being, he's trying. And if you, if you read the international newspapers or if you follow the international, international press, you can see that all even the, the the international IMF or all the international organizations now they are more and more um, I think they more and more they understand the need to change the uh, to to change and to integrate the, the, the this nature conservation and 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 uh, well particularly of course climate is one of the one of the one of the one of the problems and threats that is clearly in the political agenda, uh, we have to put biodiversity and nature in the same agenda because we cannot solve climate crisis without solving the biodiversity crisis and, and vice versa. So we need both in the same in, at the same level of, of urgency. So um, in, in my opinion, without these big players, without these international commitments, it will be more difficult. So I, we do need them, but at the same time, I agree. You said, what about education? And I also think that we, the, the investment in, in education is, has to get back. I mean, we have to put again education in the front of the, of the international policies, national policies. It's very, very important to have uh, a new education system that really puts the, the planet and uh, the protection of the planet and the relevance of the planet in, 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 in the front of, in the, in the, really in the, in the, the mainstream. Uh, so it's, um, education is, is an issue, but at this stage where we are losing so much and the threats are, so it's our, every day we have new uh, uh, threats and we understand the impact of, uh, of the, of the, of the planetary boundaries um, uh, issues, uh, we, I, I think that more and more we realized um, the need to have these international policy commitments. So I would say, but it's uh, interesting to see that, for example, the financial world world is also changing. You have more and more the international banking systems that are not supporting any more those projects of the investment that are not really that don't have a clear policy for climate for example so this is this this is happening the the, the problem is that the the, the, the it should it should, it should uh, the speed is not the speed that we need we need much more much more commitment much more investment and uh, so but that uh, but it's uh, it's it's a process that I think it's um, it's it's unstoppable. So that's the way where we, we go. I'm sure that we will. The ecological paradigm is is the new is the new uh, the new world is certainly going that way. But um, it will take as long as it, it as it takes. The the loss and uh, and uh, unfortunately, we'll have more people suffering more more human communities suffering from the 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 the, um, the, the, the lack of speed and, and awareness at the global level so i don't know if i've responded but it's um it's really um i mean it's uh, we we all know that we we'll, we all know the way there's no other way but the speed is not the speed that we need to respond and most of all to respond to the, at, at the whole level, so that we uh, that we really care for people. That's what is missing. These kind of values are missing because we are not caring for a lot of communities 
people in many places of the world that are really out as as we saw over the pandemics too it's the same the same process but some things are changing and uh, i i'm uh, in that sense i i i hope uh, things will change i uh, will see but thank you I hope the pandemics will change thank you yeah, yes yes and uh, exactly the pandemic situation that uh, we are living in has forced many countries around the world uh, to make radical interventions in people's daily life and many things have changed in a short period of time. Mm -hmm. There have been conflicts and protests uh, in many parts of the world, but uh, these conflict, conflicts and protests did not prevent for the most part of the implementation of radical policies uh, of mass lockdown in many countries. Mm -hmm. So, uh, things can change quickly. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Not for the in this case in this case not for uh, in for a good reason a good reason in health but the problem was the pandemic. Uh, what can be learned from this experience when it concerns to reverting the space of environment destruction? Mm -hmm. um, uh, does it suggest that uh, with political will, radical change is possible? And mm -hmm. thus, that is uh, possible to implement far-reaching transformative measures of mm -hmm. nature conservation uh, quickly and uh, um, on a global yeah. scale. Yeah. I think, well, I certainly think that uh, one of the, well, this intention of the Convention for Biodiversity and uh, the global intention to have a set aside of part of the planet, at least, well, some, the, the 30% aim targets from the for the CBD to have 30% of land and sea uh, set aside so protected in some kind of um, assignment i think this is a major a major achievement and we really have to have this goal very clear so we have to go for this for this goal uh, and this if we manage to have this commitment at the CBD level that will also mean that nature will become much more part of the economical system and then parts of the part of the solutions as well that means for example if we have let's say an example of the green deal if we have a major investment of on infrastructures and if we choose to have a part as we know part of the green deal as um, a percentage of the green deal has to go for the climate mitigation or climate adaptation and if we choose that those investments that we are going to uh, choose for the next decade, according to the plan of uh, uh, that we have at, at the national level or all over all the European level, if we choose, for example, to restore wetlands in order to adapt uh, coast, coastal, coastal erosion. I mean, to to respond to coastal erosion and and but also as an investment, a public investment that responds simultaneously to climate adaptation, but at the same time is going to improve the soil conditions and the soil quality. In that sense, responding to um, I mean to improve the quality of the farming system. So there are a number of of connectivities that are that will come up from this kind of funding envelope that is directed to uh, the, the, the public investment, but with a special umbrella, let's say, of, uh, of, of environment and environmental protection. And uh, that, so in that sense, uh, we, we have now in over the, this decade is critical because we'll have a package of policies and public investments, especially because of the crisis, that they have to be extremely well oriented. That is the critical issue. So we have to manage to achieve the best political commitments this year because we have the perception of the pandemics and the perception of the pandemics is clear. The nature disruption is on the basis of these pandemics and many other risks that will come up, certainly. So we need to restore nature and to achieve a good balance between human activities and nature conservation. And if, if so, if we if we if we manage to get those political roadmaps, international commitments, and at the same time benefit from a decade of public investments 
that goes uh, uh, together with this, that go together with this political roadmap, that is, I mean, this is the critical, the critical point. And of course, there are major difficulties, and uh, also because we don't have the kind of governance models, we are not organized in order to respond to this kind of uh, uh, strategic uh, implementation of fundings according to missions. That so so there are things that are not yet organized, settled down in order to implement the best policies and best investments, but 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 things tend to tend to go in the same sense. Let's see if we can profit from this situation and then then we have to be very clever. We have to have uh, a, a very active participation of the citizens. We have to to come up with this kind of uh, forum like like this one where we discuss many disciplines. Uh, acknowledging all the fields of knowledge and uh, all the perspectives and 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 really um, because we we, we it, it is important to say that we have technologies that can help us we have technologies we have science and uh, together if we have the intelligence to put this together I think I think we'll manage because th there's no other way there's no other way this is the most intelligent way to go so we I, I believe we we have a good chance, and 2021 is certainly we are going we are coming well we are at the end of the pandemics. The pandemics generate uh, the, the 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 kind of environment where 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 at least the perception is favorable to to align the economy with 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 a, with a, a the green economy with the nature conservation so i hope we, we we can i think we can we can make it but it's uh, very much um, under pressure i mean it's uh, we have this decade really and that's uh, yes. so i think the pandemics create somehow generate a very a good environment to have uh, to come up with international commitments, policies, and public investments that are organized by missions with the right actors yeah. and the right networks, we will and the, the right clusters of intelligence and knowledge and people and communities, we 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 can do it. We can do it. Thank you. Thank you very much. I will give the word to Gonzalo, who will certainly have some questions too. Thank you. <laughs> hi, hi, Elena. I think that I think the questions are piling up in the chat box. So I would like to ask if you could just in the in the answer to uh, to my question, be, short. be brief. Yes, yeah, so sorry, that we sorry, have sorry. time to address the, the the questions of the of the larger audience. I mean, I, I it was great. I really enjoyed your talk. Thank you very much. I, I, I particularly enjoy the way you uh, you showed how humans are part of nature, which is something that we often kind of forget, and and how uh, their social and biological lives really depend on nature's contributions. Um, and one of the ways to, um, and of course, I mean, these contributions are shrinking because the environment is also being degraded, so we have to pay more attention to that. And one of the ways to recognize nature contribution to people's lives of course, is to introduce notions like natural capital in the way that uh, the global economy works. I mean, a concept that I think you mentioned in your in your presentation. I mean, natural capital as some kind of notion of the world's stock of natural resources, including geology, soils, air, and so on and so forth. I mean, these resources make human life possible. And of course, the notion is useful. But it is also very much associated with visions of green capitalism mm -hmm. and the neoliberal idea that governments should use market based policy instruments to resolve environmental problems. So I suppose my question is, how can we articulate on the one hand the desire for generating profit right from businesses in a capitalist society? I mean, we live in a global capitalist society, right? And on the other hand, the urgency for proper actions to address a struggling, a struggling environment and, you know, a degrading uh, environment. Uh, do we have to break free from the neoliberal model 
mm -hmm. an impressive model of economic and environmental governance that requires more governmental intervention. I mean, do governments in Europe and other parts of the world have the bargaining power to do that at all? I mean, um, so I, I would like to, to kind of uh, hear your thoughts on that. Is it possible to promote an ecological transition without taming the beast of neoliberal capitalism? <laughs> yeah. It's a big question, but I think it's an important question. No, it is, it is. No, uh, well, in my opinion, we have to change, yeah. It's not possible to go on with the same, the same, the same, the same political system and and um, and the same way of uh, consuming, uh, consuming and producing. Let's say, consuming and producing. But I think somehow the um, we are ready for that. We are ready for that. Uh, I think that um, the kind of the kind of well. Uh, of course, we all the all the systems and the, the international the international systems and the model the models of governance are basically they work that style. They are built in a in a liberal blo block and 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 way of 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 um, of working and thinking and organizing. Everything is built in the in that way and I don't think that it's time for the state to come in and change it's not the the, the case but but the ne the level of disruption that we have achieved is so huge that I believe that in our that now we all, we all understand that this is not possible the same way we cannot recover we cannot get into the I mean, reset the system and go back to the same style, the same procedure, the same, the same processes. So things, things. Every, I think that everybody really needs the, 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 the need to change, but not everybody is willing to change the same way. At the consumers level, let's say, I think that we are more ready to accept that we can live with less that we don't need as much uh, to, to, to survive, to live happily, and even we and many other aspects are entering the system because you want to eat what is bringing you better health, a better expectation of life, um, and sometimes even better connection with your placement, with your environment, with your family. So. So a lot of a lot of, a lot of values and 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 different arguments are coming into the perception, uh, let's say, environmental of of the consumer and the, the people in general, because you are also and as yet you can is as long I mean if it, it depends of course where you live, what kind of goods do you have uh, do you have access, what is education that you a number of different issues, but in general, I think that um, the consumer is much more prepared to change. On the other hand, the let's say the the in terms of of of, of economy and those that are running and and then and, and extracting resources uh, over the planet, they also feel that they cannot exploit the same way. I mean, of, more and more that the level of resources that we have available even for that kind of economy is not anymore any longer possible the same way so some change also is is also happening in that in in that in that corner uh, so i don't think that is with with the the by imposing the, the times are very complex and i have to confess well even well the complexity is, is huge so, so we don't have really one one answer and one way, and so you. The, and the transition is probably that's the that's the meaning of transition itself. I mean, you have a lot of ideas and and complexity that is in the, in the system, and uh, the, and that this is a process. Uh, uh, so we are not ready for the future. That's the same. Is almost what uh, one of the Einstein statements. You cannot you cannot you cannot predict and work the future with the with the guidelines of the past or with you know having the brain of the past so this is um, 
the transition itself is very complex and demanding because you, you want to have a, a big change and a world change when you, you don't have, even we were discussing before, we don't have the, the, the institutional governance uh, tools and, 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 um, and organizations that allow us you know, to impose or to come up with, with, with a global solution. So there's, there's no way, there's no, no, I mean, I don't think that we have the planet organized in a way that everything is going to go smooth and, 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 and at the rate we, we imagine and, and we want, but um, the ecological transition will, will happen uh, because, first of all, because I think the perception of the consumer is changing very fast and is very demanding. And that's one of the key aspects of the process of change. Um, I don't think that is going to be the policy just, just like that. I mean, the, the, the political system will change as much, as faster as the consumer will de demand, you know. Let's say, for example, the electric cars. You know, the, we, we were discussing electric cars for, for years in, in Europe, for example, and uh, two or three years ago, you would say, "Well, I don't buy because I won't have them in the market, and it's not, it's not, it's not, it's it's very expensive. Uh, it it won't work." Is uh, but in two or three years, I mean, the 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 market changed completely because the consumer wanted this transition to happen, and then you see everybody is going there, and of course there are critical aspects you say okay but what is going to well i'm sorry you said be short be yeah. brief and i'm just expanding now this point about the consumer your question is very complex and i appreciate but it's a big discussion the question of the consumers actually is very important because we get on we're getting a lot of questions heading that direction and one is actually coming from tim ingold um who is asking uh, I am very doubtful of that the way forward has to lie in a more and more integrated and totalitarian global planetary approach, given mm -hmm. that the ecological degradation of the last 50 years that you described in your lecture has largely been driven by globalization, albeit of the wrong kind. Do you really believe that solutions have to be driven from the global level? People care for one another and for their immediate environments, but the globe cares for no one. Would it not be better to empower local people to look after their own communities and environments? No, no, I, I, I fully agree. I would love that direction. I mean, I, but I think that the emergency, especially the biodiversity crisis, cannot, cannot, it's, we don't have time for that. I mean, the, the, the 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 urgency of the of the, of the problems the, the the rate how we are losing species and and ecosystems and habitats and uh, and the life supporting systems uh, is 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 huge so i and in the climate crisis itself so i think that somehow we need some 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 global commitments i agree i i, I don't rely on them to change but I think they are part of the change, and I, we have we have to bring them, and especially commitments in terms of planetary commitments for climate and and biodiversity. I think that we have uh, to to really to have some some commitments in that sense. But by saying this, I fully agree that with what Tim was saying that we need to empower local communities. That's why I said responding to Anna Luisa. That I, I I think that uh, with this the the education uh, um, the uh, and uh, urgent we need a, um, really a strong a strong commitment with education and and, and, and uh, everywhere and I think this is this can be a very strong uh, I think program to to really to empower uh, communities of course with diversity I'm not I'm not claiming for an universal program of education nothing like that but. I mean, I think that uh, the support for education of local communities and, and people uh, should should be really a very strong investment of the decade. But in that sense, empowering local communities, generating 
uh, also some kind of uh, some some more connectivity with with with, with the placement with with the identities with the memories uh, with the legacy of of of, of local communities I, I i agree i i think that is the most powerful way of of, of changing transforming the planet but um, considering the need to to, to really to sustain some integrity of the life supporting systems, which I believe are really very much threatened. And um, I think that at least at that level, we have to come up with, for example, even today I was reading, I don't read is really the financial times, but one of my friends sent me a, an article regarding Amazon, for example, the, the Amazon forest, the, the Brazil, the Brazil, Brazil government was claiming for $1 billion uh, to the, the 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 American government in order to protect, in order to guarantee the protection of Amazon, we know that this is no this is not going probably to go to get accomplished, but they were claiming for one billion dollars to protect the Amazon. What is happening in the Amazon is absolutely it's a disaster. It's tragic. The disappearance of this regional biome. Is it, it will have a huge impact also in local communities. Do we have time to empower these communities, you know, before we lose this tropical forest? That 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 is that will be difficult my questions. Yeah, but I agree. I mean, I agree. We have to go. This has to go. I mean, this is a it's a very nice discussion that we we should have. But. Uh, yes, yeah, some some of our viewers are asking about population and population growth. Um, I mean, they say that even with strong environmental protection measures, namely in terms of decarbonization or the protection of nature and biodiversity, how can one avoid the continual global degradation of the planet with a population in continuous growth? That is a very important question. I mean, I, 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 I don't know how to. I mean, this because it's uh, if if the trend, the demographic trend goes at is uh, the models uh, explain, it's almost certain that we may have, uh, I mean, 10, 12 billion people by the end of the center, which is absolutely it's it is it's not possible to I mean to. Uh, to respond to this demand, especially if we don't control climate change and the climate scenarios, because uh, with with the climate scenarios, even 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 the 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 best climate scenarios, we 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 won't have the capacity of producing as much uh, food and responding to the, the needs of uh, such a demanding population. So this is this is a critical issue that's uh, clear to me, and I. I hope that somehow we 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 manage that 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 and we won't achieve the the the, the most uh, I mean the most uh, um, um, significant scenarios of of the I don't I hope we won't we won't get there because then then it's it's really difficult even if we, we organize some of the the contexts where where we have people living for example we have more than seventy percent of of the population of the world is living in cities. Even if we manage to better organize cities and even transform the food system in a way that is possible to 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 uh, provide food, you know, inside the urban area or producing te technologies that allow us to produce in a different way, this will help. Certainly, this will help because we'll have uh, you know 70, 80 percent of of humans living in in cities. This, this is another challenge, and of yeah. course, this will have to we will have to change and adjust uh, even the technology and the way how we produce and farm and so on. So it will depend very much on on this combination. But uh, yeah. in my in my view, anyway, if we could if we could <laughs> downgrade the the expectations of increase of population over the center, this this will certainly be better. There's also a question about perception, uh, perception of uh, environmental degradation. Antonio asks, how can we change people's perception, I suppose, and give a better understanding of the cause-effect relationship between what we do today and the impact many years from now? Can we provide more information about the small changes, for example, in terms of censoring uh, things like, you know, the process of environmental degradation. Antonio says that we've done this for, we are doing this for COVID-19. 
and that you know every day we're kind of monitoring what's happening and creating a sense of urgency that something must be done and numbers are piling up and you know oscillating every day should we start doing something like this uh, the mass media to kind of mo monitor processes of environmental degradation that, that's a, a very important very, very important question i uh, thank you for antonio for the question and i i very much agree if we could somehow um, have a way of um, monitoring uh, degradation in in all in all systems. I mean, if, if, even in the, the farming systems, if we could let, let's go back to the consumer. You know, if you know what you eat, and if you know the impact of what you are eating, if you know that, if you clearly know when you buy at the supermarket or at the the, the store of your village, if you know the origin, if you can trace back. The, the 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 what you are consuming and you know the impact at the local level uh, of what you are consuming in terms of environmental impact but also in terms of uh, investment of, of of the communities at the, at, at that, that 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 at that local or if you could realize that by eating that way you are you are driving one wetland or one one forest to uh, as fa as a matter of fact what is happening in Europe because you know I was discussing and presenting the green deal but I was not presenting I mean it's never said in the green deal where are the 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 negotiations for trade with for example South America when we import two thirds of the meat that we eat in Europe are we aware of the impact of eating this meat that's coming from South American forests you know, from the degradation of these forests, uh, if we could be aware, you know, and tracing this meat that we are eating and realize the impact uh, there and uh, in, in, in the environment in general, I think this is mo this can be very helpful indeed. So my 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 hope is that we, that's why I think that technology can help. And is, for example, these new technologies like, for example, blockchain can do a lot by uh, helping us exactly to realize what is the impact of our consume consumption of. Um, so these new technologies and censoring, for example, can certainly be very helpful in in uh, by making us like like we are part of. As I said, we are part of nature. But we don't have the tools to realize how deep connect and part we are. Huh? Yes. So, so if we could have that kind of data, that kind of information, I think this would be really great and very helpful. helpful yeah. It's a very nice. Thank you, Lena. We're kind of running out of time, so I would hand over the floor to Anna Louisa. Maybe she still has a question um, that she would like to ask before I conclude. Uh, thank you. Uh, just to mention one of the viewers, Realm, mentioned the, also the need to support uh, geodiversity, not only biodiversity. Support. And of course. Of course, no, no, thank you. And of course, I mean, geodiversity is the basis of everything. So I, I mean, when I, biodiversity is uh, because I also mentioned exactly because of the convention for biodiversity and as we have this target and uh, but of course, whenever we preserve biodiversity, we preserve job diversity. And uh, just to uh, one of and one of the most relevant uh, issues when regarding the future and the preservation of nature is certainly the soil. And I mentioned the soil formation and the conservation of soil is one of the major and most important resources for 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 farming, forestry. And uh, so we, so of course it's it's part. And I apologize. I mean, it's uh, we just say biodiversity because of the convention, but certainly geobiodiversity, geodiversity is part of uh, the huge diversity that we have the privilege to to inherit somehow, and uh, that we have the, the privilege to inherit, and we have the responsibility to keep the legacy and uh, at least to preserve the supporting systems of life. Thank you, Elena. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you, Elena, once again. I mean, I'd like to, to ask you another question about polycentric governance, but I don't think we have time. So I'm going to have to 
conclude this session by thanking you once again for your wonderful contribution to pluralizing the Anthropocene. I mean, we all learned a lot from your talk and from the discussion that followed. It was truly inspiring, so thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Um, Elena has shown that ongoing processes of environmental degradation and biodiversity decline are undermining hard-won development gains of previous decades by causing economic costs and millions of premature deaths annually. The well-being of today's youth and future generations depends on an urgent and clear break with current trends of environmental decline. And this will require reduction of the global carbon footprint and the development of new forms of environmental governance capable of constructing a global economy that is more closely aligned with the principle of the conservation of ecosystems and biodiversity. In the talk, we learned about the potential of nature-based solutions and other pluralistic policy instruments aimed at triggering a global economic, uh, e ecological um, transition despite short-sighted corporate and bureaucratic interests focused on short-term economic gains. International organizations and national governments must play an important role in triggering this paradigm shift, but ordinary citizens too have responsibility. Policy decisions should not be made top-down and unilaterally, but must take into account the views of multiple stakeholders in society. Polycentric governance is key to the long-term success of new visions of environmental governance in the Anthropocene. Please join me in thanking Elena Freitas for these wonderful contributions. And before you all go, let me just remind you that the next session of Pluralizing the Anthropocene will take place on April 26 at 2 p.m. Western European Summer Time. We will be talking to China specialists Yi Fei Li and Judith Shapiro about recent efforts in China to go green and thus revert the trend towards environmental degradation and pollution. The talk will provide a detailed account of China's new forms of coercive environmentalism and will ask whether this new radical approach in contrast to the one presented by Helena today in Europe to environmental governance is the way to go to overcome the troubles of the current era of increasing environmental uncertainties. The event is free, but registration is required. Please check the Seralvas website for more details on how to register. Many thanks once again for your support. See you again on April 26. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you to the entire audience. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.